Hey, this is Alex from X Growth. Over the holiday break, we're rebroadcasting some of our favorite episodes from the Growth Colony podcast. We'll be back in the first week of January with new episodes, but until then, we're wishing you an awesome holiday break and thanks for tuning in to the Growth Colony pod this year. All right, let's get into today's episode. Welcome to Growth Colony, Australia's B2B podcast. I'm Alex from X Growth. Each episode, we bring you B2B founders, CMOs, marketing and sales leaders to find out what makes them successful and what was behind their failures, or as we like to call them, hard-learned lessons. If you enjoy the episode, please consider giving us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts and share the pod with a friend you think could get value out of it. And of course, make sure to join the community Slack channel at growthcolony.org forward slash Slack. That's enough from me though, let's dive right in. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode. I'm Shaheen Hoda with X Growth. And today I'm talking to Ray Kloss, Director of Marketing for ANZ at Cisco, about how should APAC marketing leaders set themselves up for success and lead an effective marketing team, considering the wide range of cultures and diversity that falls under the APAC banner. The reason I'm so excited to speak to Ray about this topic is his vast experience as a business leader across APAC. Places like Japan, China, India, and so forth. There's a lot of countries that he's either lived in or manages as a marketing leader. On that note, let's dive in. Ray, thanks for joining us. Oh, Shaheen, it's a ton of fun. Yeah, same over here, man. I'm really glad that uh, that you were able to make it. And uh, and look, this topic of you know marketing to APAC is a is a fascinating one for me because I feel like if you talk to someone in the US, right? And you say, oh, is, um, you know, marketing or, or culture in Louisiana different to, uh, to New York? They would be like, oh my God, it's, it's a world apart. It's, you know, it's completely different. You, t- you do the same thing with someone in Europe and you say, you know, marketing into the French market versus the German market. They would be like, you know, it's absolutely different. It's a different story. But really, I feel like in APAC, you, that spectrum widens so much. I mean, the culture between India, you have India that falls under ba- that banner, you have Australia that falls under that banner, you have Japan that falls under that banner. And the the diversity there is is a lot greater than a lot of these other regions. Do you think there is there is merit to that? Do you think that's that's um that argument there there is truth to that? Well, Shaheen, there's one thing I'm going to start with, and this might sound like semantics. I would so love this to almost be an underlying theme of our conversation. You said and you opened marketing to APAC, and I love that you said that because that's how everybody thinks about it. How about we start focusing on marketing with APAC countries? And you'll see as we get into it, because I know you're going to ask me lots of fun questions about how, and because I really want to get to some things that people can have that are usable in their life. This is about marketing with cultures, not to cultures. And look, let's go to your real question, right? Which is how different is it? For me, it's radical. You know, I was like, you mentioned it. I lived in Tokyo. I lived in Nanjing outside of Shanghai. I've lived in um, outside of Mumbai in India. Yeah, there's no comparison, right? Between, and I I grew up in the States, right? So I grew up in America and I know the differences culturally between the States and even between the U.S., Canada, Puerto Rico, Mexico, in APJC or APAC, as you say, oh, my God, it's a radical difference in how people approach. But every culture has got that difference. And there's some really cool ways of looking at those differences that help kind of crack the code on how to work with people. So I'm excited to get into it. Let's do it. Let's do it. The first question that I want to ask you is, what do you think makes APAC such a challenging place for marketers? There's a model that I love when we look across culture. And here's a fun little thing. Like I'd ask all the people listening right now, just take a moment, kind of sit quietly, close your eyes and go, wow, when was the last time somebody told me to do something? When was the last time somebody told me to do something? And how did that feel? Now, I don't know about you. The thing that pops into my mind is usually not a great feeling of being told to do something. And here's one of the things is just reflect on your own life. When somebody from a different culture tells you what to do, how do you feel? And that's when you, ha- you haven't asked for advice. So I love this expression, Shaheen. There's that old expression that unsolicited advice lands like criticism. 
mm-hmm. unsolicited advice. So that's where, hey, I'm, hey, Shaheen, let me give you a point of view on something you just said and you didn't even ask for my opinion. It's like you feel criticized, right? And so now reflect on Western culture's willingness to tell each other what to do. So how often do you see Western cultures telling the world what needs to happen? All the time. Uh, How often do you see that in an Asia-Pacific culture? Do you see India telling the world what to do? Do you see Japan telling the world what to do? And and, oh my God, right? Like don't even put Japan and India in the same sentence. They're so culturally diverse (laughs) to each other. But one of the things that you'll find is there's a very deep, respectful culture in APJC, in APAC, which is actually often family first. It's internal first. So if you look at like you look at the traditions of Buddhism, you look at the traditions of Shinto, you look at Hinduism, um, Confucianism, Taoism, you know, you look at the the inherent Eastern culture and even the way it's written in double bite character set. It's a completely different approach to interhuman relationships than we have in the West. You know, in the West, we love listening to speakers who tell us what to do. Like we have this podcast right now where I'm telling people about what to do. Right. That's such a Western thing. And how does that land? So imagine even us in the West, we're not really thrilled about people giving us unsolicited advice and then wade into this incredibly rich, diverse culture, which in many ways was around before ours and start telling them what to do. How's that going to go? Right. So it, it, it is a real factor. I mean, we, we're talking about the difference, right? So and that's I think it's a great segue in terms of talking about what are some of the mistakes that you see? marketers make in this region and, and i'm and i'm guessing we, we're going to start talking about telling people what to do but i, I, I love to <laughs> i love to unpack that a little bit more to tell, yeah. tell a little bit about some of the mistakes you've seen being in this in this um in this region for such a long time what are some of the mistakes you've seen marketers make when they're operating across apac or or apg Oh, I love it, Shane. Look, I, I, I remember once, quite well into my career, I walked into this one with my mouth open. I had one of my leaders say, hey, Ray, you've got two ears and one mouth. When are you going to take the hint? Oh, dang. It's like, dang. <laughs> oh, dang. Right? That was hard. <laughs> but it was, it was right between the eyes and it was perfect. And that, that's a big part of it. So for me, look, I'm obsessed. My feeling in marketing is that one of the most important things we do is we analyze, analyze, analyze. We look at where our consumers, and consumers, B2B consumers, B2C consumers, the people who are going to consume our content. We analyze where where our audiences are at for preference, and then we're working out what to do to help shift that preference. And the first thing I'd say is that is a listening function, right? So whether you're listening on social, you're listening through the data, you're listening through how people interact with your campaigns, there's this incredible over-rotation, I feel, need, this need to over-rotate, to listen uniquely to the different countries. But here's, this would be like, if there, to me there's like a cheat code for doing this, oh my God, have somebody in every culture that you're marketing in who's in that culture who is your buddy and you ask them this fundamental question, which is what do you need? What do you feel this country needs from our brand to grow our preference? Start there every time. So, you know, so still with Cisco right now, I've got responsibility for our brand across all of APJC. When I get onto a a call with my colleagues in India or my colleagues in Japan or Korea, my opening question is always, what are you trying to do and what do you need? Like, how can we, how can we best bring in all the best that Cisco has to shift the preference in that market? And that's, that's the pivot. And so, you know, the thing that I feel people really... God bless us, we get enthusiastic, right? We get really excited about something. We think we've got the greatest campaign ever, and we're really excited to roll that campaign all across the whole world. And it's amazing to me how sometimes those campaigns can actually alienate a different culture, right? If you have a culture that's different enough from the culture where that campaign was built, it can actually potentially be an alienating culture. Like every touch point, Shaheen, we either raise our brand preference or we lower our brand preference. There's no neutrality. So I, I, I'm conscious. I want to give you airtime. I'm I'm on a roll. No, I I I love it, and and we love cheat sheets. By the way, here, bring, <laughs> bring on the cheat sheets, man. That's uh, that's what we're all about. No, I'm kidding. But well, no, 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 no. I hear you. So I, and like, here's something because I can like I feel your listeners, right? You'll have a listener sitting there going, oh, "Are you kidding me? Like I'm one person. I've got you know I got a small emerging third tier, you know, tier three IT company." I can't afford to have somebody in Thailand. I can't afford to have somebody in Vietnam. I can't afford to have somebody in the Philippines. Yeah, but you got somebody there. You're, you know, you've either got a distributor who's selling, you've got 
you know, you've got people on the ground who are trying to achieve a business result. Like we, we, we always should be, I'm, I know that we're always marketing it in a place where we have catchers to help drive that preference through. So there's always somebody to talk to. And that for me has been, I suppose, my cheat code is I always build that network of what I would call marketing aware colleagues. This works in tiny tier threes as well. You know, I've, I've in other brands that I've worked in in my past, I was working with the distributor in Indonesia or I'd be working with a partner in Thailand because we didn't have sufficient critical mass in those countries to have our own. Okay. So uh, I, I, I get the idea that you have to have like an insider to give you that, that feedback or for them to actually create it. But do you think also it's possible to create something in HQ and then use the, use is not the right word, but, but really communicate with, with the other individual in terms of getting feedback? Or do you think it, it needs to be created ground up from a regional location. Shaheen, I think there's, still, I want to break that down a little bit. So here's the first thing. If you're selling a technology which is fundamentally the same in the country, it's going to be deployed. Oh my God, you can make a lot of central content. And let me give you the, my, one, of, one of my favorite examples, right? So I'll move it away from, I'll move it to a brand I've never worked for. I think most of us would know what an MRI machine is or an x-ray machine, but MRI, you know, it's the big donut that people yeah. go through and like, don't, 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 right? It's going to be the same MRI machine if I sell it in Johannesburg, if I sell it in Mumbai, if I sell it in Shanghai, if I sell it in London, if I sell it in Boise, Idaho, right? It's the same freaking big donut that's going to go boom, 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 boom. And the big issue I'm going to have is things like power, right? All of that technical content, everything that relates to why that MRI machine instead of the other people's MRI machine, all that content should be made centrally profitably like this is the thing that drives me nuts is you'll see people going oh we need to localize our technical content i'm like my god why are you actually going to use a hub a router or a server technically differently in thailand than you're going to use it in germany no so on your technical content and and the thing that i find is there is this is what your you know our audience will figure out if your audience is cross-culture are in community together. And here's what that looks like. You know, so for instance, at Cisco, at Cisco, we have our certified Cisco engineers, our CCIEs. It doesn't matter what country you're from. You've done all the same training and you talk the same language, right? And yes, you might be a CCIE who, whose Indonesian is your first language, or you might, Bahasa rather, or you might be a CCIE that your first language is German. That technical content, it's all common language, right? Okay. Here's where it changes, Shaheen, is when you're going for emotions, so if you're con- and and remember for me actually sorry as a marketer, how we make people feel is way more. I mean, well, Maya Angelou has that quote: "People will always remember how you made them feel; they might not remember what you did." And a huge part of marketing is actually how we feel. You know, in, in best best practice, we're sixty percent brand development, forty percent demand gen. So sixty percent brand, forty percent demand, and in that brand, it's about emotion. Now, emotional content. If there's a core to human intrinsic motivation and core to intrinsic human motivation is we love freedom, we love joy, and we love growth. Love those three. And that's cross-cultural. So if your content is about freedom and joy and growth, you're starting to be in the right place. But you've got to be careful because some things that represent freedom in the West can actually be illegal in countries in ABJC. So you've got to watch that alienation, right? Um, but as soon as you start moving into what other people think, getting ahead, what performance looks like, what benef- what good looks like in that emotional setting, now you're into ma- major cultural differences. So I would say essentially, oh my God, technical content, knock yourself out. When you start moving into the emotional content, that's where it's really important to be listening. And like, for instance, our global brand team within Cisco – they work with us all the time. You know, they show us early runs. They go, how's this going to land? How do you feel? They make sure they're inclusive around all cultures in creating that content. But they still create it global, but they're listening when they create it. Got it. Got it. What about... You does know, that case, help? That, that def- definitely does help where, you know, you centralize technical and then you decentralize Anything that, that has to do with emotions. Well, you listen. You don't. You don't have to decentralize what you're doing with emotion. Like with the technical content. Like, look. Let's be frank. If we're if we're building technical content, how our secure security products work, I don't need to check with the with the people in other cultures if that core technical content's okay. I can just build it and send it. 
right? When we move into more of the brand style content and even case studies, like this is one of the ones that, you know, local case studies really matter, right? It's the only time that the global case studies work really well is if you're at the top end of big industry, because clearly a telco in Malaysia is going to operate similar to a telco in Hungary, and they'll listen to each other because they're giant companies. But as soon as you start getting down to smaller companies, case studies are actually starting to head into that emotional thing, right? So why do we do a case study? To build confidence, to show what's easy, um, to inspire people. Those are emotions. So case studies, you know, it's often international case studies can land on deaf ears in a local geography. This podcast is brought to you by Xgrowth, an account-based marketing agency with a strong specialization in the APAC market. If you're starting to roll out an account-based marketing initiative in your firm or looking to take your current program to the next level, whether it's one-to-one, one-to-few, or one-to-many, don't try to do it all alone. Chat with the ABM experts at Xgrowth to see how they can help you both on strategy and execution of your next ABM campaign. To find out more, head to www.xgrowth.com.au. That's www.xgrowth.com.au. Let's get back to the podcast. Let's talk about if a marketer, you know, let, let's say I'm a marketer and I'm thinking that one of my one of my locations is, let's say, Indonesia. And I have to uh, I have to get into the banking sector in Indonesia, and, and maybe I'll have some resources to to hire as uh, as part of the marketing team in Indonesia. What would be you know maybe I can I can hire two or three people there sure. um, to help me out for uh, it's a it's a big market it's an important market for us. How should I go about it? Who should I hire? What 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 would be your advice there, Ray? Well, there's a fun thing. Whenever you look cross-culturally, the starting point, Shaheen, has to be, who am I? What's my culture? And what is the gulf between my culture and this culture? And and on these factors, how how willing am I to tell other people what to do? And Shaheen, we all know ourselves, right? So we know if we're the person who does all the talking in the meetings and is telling everybody what to do. So And literally, like I did some beautiful work with an agency that works with the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, where they work with people as they're headed overseas. So they help Australian bureaucrats when they're becoming, you know, whatever, a lead counsel in China or whatever. And they always say the starting point, whether we're hiring or whatever we're doing, is there's this great thing. We always think we're the neutral one. We always think we're fun. We mostly think people like us. And we mostly think kind of everybody's kind of like us. And in reality check, they're not, Right. And in a funny way, there are some cultures which are way more predisposed towards being overt, didactic, willing to tell people what to do. And so the tricky, one of the big things hiring cross-culturally is if you haven't done a whole lot of hiring, if you're early in your career, one of the biggest risks is you will hire, you will, we tend at the beginning of our career to hire people like ourselves because they feel comfortable. And so there's a big challenge around going, no, actually, what I need to do is I need to hire a top performing person in this culture. So a starting point would be if you, if to your, answer your specific case study, one of the most powerful things would be to get immersed into Indonesian team that's already on the ground, which maybe is the non-marketers, and start understanding what high performance looks like. And we all, I mean, Shanna, you know, you're, you've been around, I've been around. People who intervo, interview well in the West are sometimes the big talkers and maybe there's a lot of research now that shows that sometimes the people who don't interview well are actually going to be best in the role. Hmm. And you're going to run into that same challenge. Like hiring, oh my God, hiring people in your own culture, good luck, right? That's, a, that's a, an advanced um, but really fun experience. Truthfully, like I love it. But then hiring into another culture, what does success look like? And people will, like somebody who might be absolutely a rock star for the role, might feel nothing like what you're used to meeting in performance. So to me, when you're going into Indonesia, because and to me, there's there's some really great training um, available even externally. Not you know you don't have to work for Cisco to get trained on this, but oh my God, do some training around recruitment. And the big thing is focusing on the performance in the role and the person's proven ability to perform in the role in the culture. And you've really got to drop all those emotional cues that can sometimes excite us when we're interviewing within our own culture. I don't know if I've been specific enough on that, but Interesting. You know, like when, if, I, if, if, I'm, if I'm interviewing somebody in Australia 
there's there's all of this kind of unspoken community connection that happens in the interview that you go, oh yeah, this person's going to rock, right? Because they're whatever. You got to get rid of all of that when you're interviewing cross culture because you're not from Indonesia, and you and unless you've lived, I'm not like here's my one comment. I'll say this every other podcast. I I have a minor in Japanese studies, actually North Asian studies from university. I did Japanese martial arts. I did tea ceremony. I had a wonderful partner for a while from Japan. I lived in Japan. And after all of that, I worked out, I'm never going to get the culture. Like the more (laughs) I spend time trying to get the culture, I went, I'm never going to get the culture because I'm just not born here. And one of the greatest gifts of my life was I had a wonderful woman that I worked with who literally spent half of her life growing up in Japan and then moved to the U.S. for the second half of her life. And then she went back to Japan and she and I got to work together. So she absolutely could translate, right, between the two. And she just showed me the incredible gulf of my understanding. And it was, it was humbling and freeing to go, wow, I really want to listen here. So, you know, if I'm, hire, if I'm hiring three people in Indonesia, the first thing I'm working out is who's my hiring buddy who's in Indonesia, who's going to help me with the performance and the local culture to make sure I don't get the cues wrong. Because my unconscious bias is going to work against me. I love that. That's a, that's, that's a hiring buddy. A solid, solid the cheat approach. Code, but the, cheat code, the, the cheat code is have the local hiring buddy. <laughs> Got it. Got it. That's uh, sorry, I cut you off. I cut that's going to go in the show notes for sure. But uh, no, it's it's um, yeah. Like when we're talking about it, it's like yeah, it makes sense. But I would imagine it would be hard to make this to to roll this out actually, right? To well, immerse yourself in a culture. Yeah. Here's some. It's really hard. Here's something that's really powerful, right? If you want to, if you want to learn a culture and you want to learn what business performance looks like, I'm a huge fan of mentoring because mentoring is fifty fifty. Like when I mentor people, like wow, you give back when you mentor. Are you kidding me? I get so much back moment by moment in the mentoring. I'm like, don't do anything for the future. It's like, oh my god, you're doing it for now. So here's a here's a radical thing. If you've got an APEC role, I would challenge you to have somebody you're mentoring who's a top performer in each of the major cultures that you're covering. So, you know, if you've got Japan in your remit, who are you mentoring from Japan? Mm. And then the secret is make sure it's somebody who's a top performer and start getting to know what a top performer in Japan feels like. And they don't need to work for your brand either. You know, like, oh my God, everybody in every country, there's amazing young talent who would kill to mentor with you. And you, I mean, everybody listening to this podcast if you want to get a, another cheat code on ramping yourself up on a culture, mentor talent in that culture. And they will reverse mentor you. I, I would tell you, every mentoring I've had, every mentor engagement I've had, whether I'm being mentored or I'm the mentor, it's always a reverse mentoring for both. So that, that's a really good, for me, that's one of the most powerful ways to learn what performance feels like in another culture. Interesting. So, so being a mentor or a mentee, is, yeah. is, uh, is another cheat code. Okay. Got it. Okay. The, re- well, the, reason, uh, the reason for that is what, what like, this, it'd be so easy to miss this. When you're mentoring somebody, it's so cultural. You know, so if I'm mentoring somebody in Australia, it's like we're verbose and laughing and we're talking straight into the problem. If I'm mentoring somebody in, a, in another culture, I'm going to experience all of their, all of the gulfs between us in our communication styles. And it's like, ah, oh, that's why that happens when I'm trying to get stuff done at work. This yeah, because the they're going to come to you with all their problems, right? Yeah, but not as readily, not as, but see, even that, so Shaheen, that's like a Western point of view. You know, so boom, I love it. You're, you right now are giving that example. What I'm mentoring, one of the big things when I'm mentoring people from a, what we call the APEC region, they don't come to you with their problems because that's not part of the, you know, that might be, they don't come as readily, maybe. Not everybody, everybody's different, right? But that's the kind of stuff you start experiencing. It's like even what they want to do in a mentorship. Like if I'll be mentoring, I'm actually mentoring somebody right now again from India and what she's, she's one of our top performers and how she approaches that mentor relationship is totally different to how a top performer from Australia would approach it. Totally different. And Very she doesn't interesting. Like yeah. And so that's where you suddenly go, wow, I need to have this calibration when I'm trying to work this country on campaigns. Very interesting. Got it. So it's, it's it. a great cheat code. It's a great cheat code. Okay. All right. Next question that I want to ask you, Ray, we kind of touched on it and we talked about how some cultures might be very open to 
give advice and criticize and some some wouldn't. And I want to get a little bit more specific and talk about specific geographical locations and and how would approach ones of a marketer's approach change other than the the elements that we talked about or what should a marketer keep in mind when they're going for some of these markets, right? Other than the fact that they need to have somebody local who understands the culture and give them advice. You know, that's that's that, let's assume that is a given. Right. What are some of the other things that someone might need to take into consideration, for example, when they're looking at Japan? I think Japan is a is an interesting one. I've spoken to a lot of marketers here in in Australia who might have a or, or actually in, even in Singapore who have a, a response. Japan falls under their umbrella and uh, they're like, you know what? I'm not sure what to do with Japan. How do I? Well, I don't even know where to start. What is what is your advice to someone who is uh, who's who's looking at Japan as a market to uh, to uh, and Japan falls under their um, umbrella? I, look, I, there's something that I've said is I've said of every country that I've lived and worked in, the one that I I personally feel the most alien in, where I meaning I am the alien, is actually Japan, and the reason for that is my experience, like my experience with Korea, my experience with China, my experience with India, you know, I can go all through the, about my personal experience with the Southeast Asian countries. It's hard to put a, a finger on it, but I would say that Japan is the one that it's like my intuition is the worst. <laughs> and what I mean by that is like, you know, I like my intuition, my intu- you know, what's our intuition based up on? Yes, it is based up on feeling, but it's also based on unbiased, con- uh, unconscious bias. It's based on experience. It's all this, like, there's all of this stuff that goes into what we think is our intuition. And then there's actually real intuition. And in Japan, that culture is so incredibly different from if, we, if you're coming from a Western background, right? And there's, a, there's an extra piece I would add. Those countries, um, and particularly for me, it's China, Korea, and Japan, those countries in APEC that use double bite as their core character set. You have to almost kind of try and fail to learn Mandarin. Mm. And I did. I tried and failed. Like I, I did learn some Mandarin for after a, a lot of effort. But the big thing of learning is going, oh, my God, the way the language builds up is alien to my brain. Like when we, when you and I, are, um, Shaheen, are talking in English, and even when you speak with languages that are, have originated around Arabia and the Middle East, so you've got Greek, you've got Arab, you've got, um, and even that spreads in towards parts of India and the Hindu culture, there's this way in, we, in which we use language. And in double bite, it's so different. And I got very real, like tiny little case study. You know, I, we were, I've launched a number of brands in China and Japan and you know how there's expressions like Nike, just do it. Yeah. One global brand, I won't go into the specifics of the global brand, but one global brand that I worked with had a phrase like that. And there was literally no translatable concept in Japan of the concept. So we're sitting there going, how would you translate you know, this into Japanese? And the Japanese <laughs> were like, you can't because we don't care. It's like not something we, because, you know, what do we do with our brand statements? Our brand statements are things we strive towards, right? So with Cisco, we're the bridge to possible. And we strive to that. We want to show people that you have a possible, our technology and our capabilities are a bridge to what you want to make happen. So it's inspirational and it's motivational. So there's a thing about when people say, like, I have kind of a thing, come on guys, um, come on people. Japan is the number three economy in the world. If you're opening up in Japan, you're planning on doing a big number. If you get Japan right, you probably have an impact on your share price. For X sake, <laughs> it's going to say something stronger. Hire some <laughs> Japanese people. Like that's your starting point. If if you have Japan in your ring, hire some people on the ground because you, you just have to. It's it's like you know you know that if you're going to Mars, you're taking oxygen with you, right? You know that if you're going diving, you're taking a scuba set set with you. If you're going to Japan, you need to take Japanese people along to you. And so, for instance, within uh, uh, their focus on perfection is not probably the right way to put it, but they have a focus on excellence in Japan, which is unparalleled. And sometimes even our technical content, if our technical content has a hint of kind of optimism, it can be a problem in Japan. So Japan is like this wickedly pragmatic content for B2B marketing, right? They really just want to know, how does it work? Like, this is the land of tell me how this works. And I will decide if I want to use it. And then more importantly, if it doesn't work, what are you willing to do for me to make me whole? 
Right. I th- the, the, I, you know, we could, we, could, we could do an hour on my experiences in Japan alone. So my short advice to be, if, you've got, if you have Japan in your remit, honestly, don't think about it like, oh, I've got Korea and China and Philippines and I've got Japan. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. You've got Japan. Like Japan, man, you've got Japan. Right? <laughs> what a gift. Like what an amazing gift that you have this culture because it is, I love the culture up there. The people are amazing. But you have just gone to the Marianas Trench, which if you know, people don't know it, that's the deepest part of the ocean. What I mean is you've gone someplace that is so different from where you've grown up and the rewards are immense. There, here's, I, I mentioned how I did some, we did some work, um, consulting work with that agency that worked with DFAT. One of the metrics that they use for culture is what is, what is a culture looking for in a meeting, right? What's a culture looking for in a meeting? For instance, being cheeky, and this is dangerous because now we're sweeping generalizations over cultures and that's not cool. But statistically, you know, you could, there's a thing that oftentimes what you're looking for in America is you might be looking for agreement, agreement on the path forward, right? Being really cheeky, remember this is an Australian agency, so the Australian agency set of Australians, what Australians love in a meeting is time back, you know, the best meeting for an Australian is you get it done faster than the meeting, right? So if it's a half-hour meeting and you get everything done in five minutes, like, man, that was a great meeting. See ya. <laughs> right. In Japan, what people are looking for in the meeting, you know, brace yourself for this. What people are looking for in the meeting is, who are you? What are your values? And will you listen to me? Are you here to actually listen to what I need, right? And so think about how we trundle in as a Western you know, from a Western culture, we're like, hey, we've got this really important meeting. We've got this big campaign. We need to get it going. And I want to hear what you people need because I really want to get this campaign going. Can we get consensus? And fast is good. And, you know, it, it's like you've just, I don't know, it's like you've just run through a meditation yoga retreat, symbols attached to your knees and um, a tuba. <laughs> You're out of place. That's fascinating. That, I, I love that. that. I remember. Yeah, it does. It does. I mean, it's it's a it's a really interesting concept comparing meetings. I remember I, I lived in in Dubai for a while, and in Dubai, when you have a meeting, especially with the uh, you know locals, you would have an hour long meeting, and then for fifty five minutes of that, you're talking about family and how the family is yep. and. You know, what What are you doing? What's your background? Tell me a little bit about you. And and it's the last five minutes that everything gets done. And they're like, so what do you want? Yep, done. No problem. And, uh, and that's it. Well, it's very different. Very different. And I love that me, comparison across the cultures. Let me give you a very real experience. So I d- used to do a martial art called kendo. in my And kendo, some of you might see it. It's, it's the traditional martial art of the samurai. And you see people, they wear this blue outfit and they have kind of a mask on and they have a bamboo shinai or a bamboo um basically a bamboo sword but it's called a shinai and your sensei your teacher your master what they say is they say when you when you sit across from your opponent you know what their ability is based on how they dressed and how they respect themselves and there's this really long silence and in some cases our sensei would choose to not, so we, you know, part of, if I literally, you pay, I was doing this in the States, right? So kind of your classic, you know, like you do a yoga class, you pay and you go and there's time. And so the sensei would sit across from a student and he would look at the student and go, no, nope, not today. We're not doing it today. The reason we're not doing it today is because you haven't put your gi on properly. You're not doing, you know, you're just not in a good place. So go stand, go, you know, go over there and work on your state. And work on that. And that's why, for instance, like people, bow, the reason people bow to each other is they're honoring each other for showing up with the best that they are in that moment in time to practice kendo. That's the culture, right? I can't tell you how many Japanese executives I've met who have kendo backgrounds right? or something similar or they do tea ceremony. And, and you know, we, we see these things. And I, I was going to say the real trick with, with Westerners, I always call it the kind of National Geographic moment is we think we know a culture because we watch National Geographic. You know, it's like I can watch the Blue Planet until I'm blue in the face. I still don't know how to dive with a great white shark, right? So there's this thing about in the Japanese culture that what they're looking for from you in the interaction is really different than what maybe you're used to in your own culture. And, and for me personally, just my own personal experience, I found it more different for me than any other country, any other culture on the planet. Love it. All right. I know we are running a little bit 
Uh, we're not running over time, but we're we're oh. close. We're close. So edit. I want to. You've, you've uh, got oh. the power of the edit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I'm not going to edit any of this out. This is good stuff. I want to also ask you about India. I think that that, that will be yes. the, the last. Oh, I um, love India. Last I ge- love it. geographical I love location it. I want to talk about. So, what, what are your thoughts? What, what will be your advice for India for uh, well, against first anyone thing, who it falls she- under their umbrella? Shaheen, we cannot have this conversation on the 30th of April and not say, oh my God, what's going on with the pandemic? So it's just like that's moments true. of that's very true. to say, oh my God, right? I, I love that. I can't tell you like countless experiences of joy traveling in India and working in India. Like uh, the, the warmth and the hospitality from strangers is on another level. A uh, very real example, my pregnant partner and I were traveling on an overnight train between two cities, which even the Indian people told us we were crazy. And in the middle of the night, this had, you know, this was a long time ago. This was in the nineties. And this use could happen. Like a whole group of the army had to get on the train. They didn't have seats and they moved people. Right. And this wonderful family saw myself and my six month pregnant partner. And they're like, come and join us in their like first class cabin thing. And they had all this food that they brought from home and they fed us and made sure she was comfortable. And I, like, I could tell you, hours of stories of that incredible comfort. When it comes to marketing, there's a fascinating quality of India, which is, this was my own personal experience. When I, you can literally do this. You can go on the street in India and ask somebody directions, say, hey, I don't know how to get to whatever, you know, the, I don't know how to get to the, um, the Taj Mahal. You can see it. But you, and what they will do is they will give you directions even if they don't know how to get there. There's this thing that I just don't, I, I, and I've, I laugh, I've got so many beautiful friends in India and I'll say, what is with that? And they're like, I don't know. We just have this thing, right? We just want to please people. So they'll, they'll give you the directions. So for me, working in India is, and I always kind of, I don't know, I kind of joke with this is when you find people speak your language quite fluently, the trick is you could miss the cultural difference. And I'll, I'll bring it home, right? I was an American who moved to Australia, 200 year old American colony, sorry, 200 year old English colony. I moved to another 200 year old English colony, the forks on the left, the spoons on the right, everybody speaks English. Heck, it ought to be pretty similar. It's like, oh my God, there's, it's radically different between being an American and being in Australia. And then India makes it even further. So again, like to everybody listening on the podcast, if you don't have a personal experience of India, it's really easy to miss it because they're so, they're so warm and accommodating that it's really easy to miss that you think you've got agreement. You think you're on the same page. You think you have consensus. They get off the call and they go, I have no idea what that person was talking about, but hey, it's okay because they're down in Sydney or they're wherever. Let's just keep going with what we need to do to be successful. Um, And I'm being cheeky, like we're generalizing, but to me, India, again, is another one of those cultures that it's really easy to miss how radically different. And I think one of the biggest challenges will be if if you've grown up in a Western culture, so you've been grown up in Australia, you've grown up in, in the U.S., or you've grown up in a very modern, developed country like Singapore, it's, it's really quite, and you've never been to India, it's quite something to just get off the plane in India and see what advertising looks like in India, right? And anybody who's been to India, you're probably smiling, you know what I mean? You, know, you get in your taxi and you drive from the Mumbai airport all the way down to, to the viaduct area. It's like an hour-long drive. And it's, it is a cultural experience of going, wow, you know, the concept of marketing is cut through, Shaheen. Like, how do I cut through? It's like, my God, there is so much content and noise in India. How do I ever get my brand known? Shaheen, as a B2B marketer in India, if you've never been on the ground there, it's really hard to comprehend the incredible amount of messaging in India. Like, there's so much noise. There are so many channels. And so one of the things that I'm always focused on for, with my Indian colleagues is almost thinking about India as an account-based marketing market. It, kind of, like bear with me for a second for the analogy. What I mean by that is with ABM, you clearly get very, very targeted. You know, if we're doing ABM in Australia for the Australian Defense Force, it's that targeted, right? We're, we're using digital media, we're using cookies, we're using, you know, in-office placement and elevators down to that level. In India, you can spend a fortune and disappear, like just disappear into the noise and never be seen. So it's a really different market for for being super specific in the brief of what is it that you're actually trying to achieve. You know, so if somebody comes to you and says, hey, I want to raise our brand preference in India, you're like, whoa, have you got millions? You know, I always say, where, who do you want to change the brand preference with? Which types of roles 
in which organizations. Like India is a place where you want to be sitting there going, who are my 300 companies? Who are my 3,000 companies that I'm targeting? And being really, tar- being really targeted on that, like shifting brand momentum in India, you've really got to be targeted to do it because you can so easily be dispersed across just the massive volume of noise, messaging, and people that are there. Interesting. So, so be laser laser focused on on the accounts that you're going after, and don't and the roles. Yeah, got it, got it. Okay. That's really good advice. That's 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 great advice. That country probably almost more than any, almost more than any because of the immense amount of traffic going on. Love it. Okay. That is uh that is some solid advice. Now, before we wrap up, uh Ray, sure. I, I mean, what we talked about this was amazing. I I feel like there was just so much, so many golden nuggets in this conversation and so much for a lot of APAC leaders and and APJ leaders to to take away. But I have a few rapid questions I want to ask you before we wrap up. All right. Good to go. So the first thing I want to I want to ask you is what is one resource? It could be a book, it could be a blog, podcast, talk, whatever it is that fundamentally changed the way you work or live. Good to great by Jim Collins. So That's great I'm, I'm not a business book reader. I'm not a business book reader. Cards on the table, right? Like I, I have to find all these other ways to get content into my brain because I don't like reading lots of business books. But good to great. I love that premise of get all the best people on the team and then go like a freaking hedgehog. <laughs> right? I found that that simple clarity of bring on board really passionate people, that their passion aligns to what I'm trying to do, then kind of get the heck out of their way and then just go like a banshee on that focus thing. I, I can tell you that in my career that has worked every single time. Love it. Love it. It is a great book. It is a great book. And uh, no, I love it. All right. So question number two, if you could only give one advice to B2B marketers, what would it be? Listen, listen in all way, shape and form. Listen to your stakeholders and you don't have to do what they say. Like one of the things I always say is I'm always really interested in listening to my sales colleagues and listening to what they want and listening <laughs> to what they need. Doesn't mean I'm going to do it. And what I often do is I always go, Hey, I don't, you know, I, I do, I did do sales. I did some pretty high end sales in my background. And I say, Hey, I never asked to look at your close plans for your deals. So why are you asking to go deep on my marketing uh, tactics? And I'm cheeky with that, right? I, I have, I like my, I love my sales stakeholders, but listen, 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 listen. And then I always sleep on it. Always at least sleep on it before I make a call. And what I'm always trying to find is what's the best, our role as a B2B marketer, I always say this is remember your CFO could have put the money towards product development. They could have hired another salesperson. There's so, they could have given it back to shareholders as profit, whether you know, private or publicly held. But they gave us that money. And they gave us that money so that we create preference for our brand. So what I always am looking at as a B2B marketer is I listen to every listen to all my stakeholders and then how do I best spend that dollar? to get the biggest preference impact in the targeted direction I'm looking for. So not like I don't need to I don't need to move all of Australia on Cisco, but I know if I know who the most important people are to shift and I want to make sure that's where I'm spending our efforts. So Got listen it. and then focus. Got it. Question number 3. What are the influencers that you follow in the marketplace? Sorry, sorry in the marketing space. Yeah, look, I'm cheeky. I, I follow my ment- my mentees, and I mean this sincerely. Oh. I am fascinated by the freshness that comes with new people. And just sit with this for one second, right? For generations, we've known that singing is a great thing, so keep singing, right? We know dancing is a great thing, keep dancing. There's other things that are probably similar to singing and dancing, keep doing those. But what you watch with every generation is they're more free. Every generation is more free than the previous one. More free to have different marriages, more free to have different relationships, more free to not have to drink tea with their pinky out, more whatever. Like you watch all the stuff that restricts us, that fades with each generation. So for me, what I do, I, I very actively ensure that I have a significant number of mentees every year and I refresh it every year. So I work with people for a year. 
I wouldn't say I work, it's probably more we play together, like in a mentorship relationship. And those people coming in, they're so passionate. And, and for, like everybody on the call, hey, if you're at that end, you know how passionate you are. It's just the air you breathe. And hey, everybody at my end of life, remember how passionate you were? Like, oh my God, mm -hmm. right? That passion is real. Usually as we get older, what's happened is we've socialized it out of ourself with all those historic restrictions. And the kids, the young people coming through, they are a whole new level of freedom. And that to me is what I'm watching in marketing because we all want the freedom, even, even if we are older. Like, you know, let's joke about it, right? You can joke about all the young people got onto Facebook and then all the oldies got on and then all the young people left and went to the new, more fun free thing. Being cheeky, right? Just being cheeky. But so, no matter what age you are, you want, we want that freedom. So I do find that some of the best marketing ideas are actually coming through in the freshest minds. Love it. Love it, Ray. There's a very different answer to, uh, to a lot of our guests. And I, I absolutely love And I that. challenge you on that. I challenge you on that where you go, wow, I would, cause see, I would rather, I would rather learn something new that's never been done before than hear what worked five years ago. Cause frankly, we all know this, what worked five years ago doesn't work today. We've, we've just gone through the single biggest impact on our race on this planet in a hundred years. And we're still in it. We're still in it. And what true. worked, what, what worked three years ago doesn't work now. I guarantee yeah, like, yeah. I, boy, it doesn't work. So the fresh minds are where the fresh ideas are. The new, that's what you're looking for, right? New inspiration not repeat. Love it. Last question I got, Ray, is cool. what's something that excites you about B2B today? Look, for me passionately, um, particularly in technology, I have a view that I see that the world's getting better every day. The world is getting better every day. And sometimes you got to take a long look at that, like it, meaning you got to pull really high back. But, you know, I remember, I remember my dad coming home from a democratic convention that was fighting for civil rights and they all got beat up by the police in Chicago, right? That was 1968. That happened in my lifetime, right? And we, we have a, an approach to diversity and inclusiveness that we could only dream about in 1968 as an example. Okay. So the, for me, the world's getting better. And there's so much research that says, oh my God, when you educate people, oh my God, when you get educate people, when you educate people, you get chills, right? On what's possible. And technology enables us to educate. Like look at even what happened with this pandemic. We just busted loose on distance learning. How powerful to have distance learning. You know, like, you know I'll joke, I, I'm a big meditator and I love my yoga. I love my meditation. It's big for me. I can listen to podcasts now while I'm sitting on my sofa that when I was born, I was going to have to get on a plane and fly to freaking Tibet to hear. <laughs> and I would. I had to. I, that's the only way it was going to happen is I was going to get on a plane. And as a kid growing up in my, my beginnings in Chicago, that wasn't going to happen. And now children all over the world can hear all this content, which is going to inspire them, enlighten them, and take the world forward. So for me as a B2B marketer, I absolutely see I, – I, here, I can make it really, really, really specific. This is not a plug for Cisco. This is how my brain works. Cisco on Earth Day donated 100 million US dollars, 100 million US dollars to sustainability efforts to help remove a lot of the stuff that's in our planet right now that could make our world a better place if we got rid of it. Okay. 100 million dollars. Do you know what? Wow. When we do a great job in B2B marketing and we increase preference for the cool stuff that Cisco does that helps companies operate better, we create profit that allows Cisco to take a leadership position on cleaning up the planet. Businesses, healthy businesses can often do positive things in our communities that our governments can't get to because of the challenges of how governments are built. So that's not a negative on governments. Governments are built a certain way. They've got to do consensus. They've got to do all this stuff that they do to, which is a good thing because then you don't have weird shit. As businesses, when we're vibrant and we're successful, our products make the world better and our profits can be directed to making the world better. And that ignites me as a B2B marketer. I love that, Ray. That is, uh, this was a great conversation, Ray. I, uh, as I said before, I think the audience is going to take a lot out of it and you just topped it with the rapid questions as well. So, uh, so look, thank you so much again for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. And, uh, and, and great chatting with you.
Uh, Shaheen, it was a ton of fun. So the appreciation is right back at you. This was 50-50 for me. I had fun. Final offer. I'm on LinkedIn. Yes. Anybody's got some funky questions and they're going, what the heck? You know, send me a question on LinkedIn. What's, what's, uh, what, what's your LinkedIn handle? What's uh, the, Ray Kloss? Oh, God, I don't Raymond know. Kloss? Ray Kloss. If you, Ray Kloss. If you search Ray Kloss Cisco, you'll find you won't. You won't miss it. Okay. All right. Well, thanks again, Ray. Thanks, Shaheen. Have a great one. Thanks so much for joining us on this episode. If you enjoyed it, please consider leaving us that five-star rating on Apple Podcasts and sharing the pod with a friend. If you'd like to continue the conversation, please make sure to join the community Slack channel at growthcolony.org forward slash Slack. Growthcolony.org forward slash Slack. Thanks again for all the support. We're looking forward to seeing you again in the next one.